evening hours of January 12, 2016, 18-year-old Dylan Parker was attending a party in his hometown of Osborne, Idaho. Towards the end of the night, Dylan decided he wanted to leave the party, but it was snowing and cold outside, so he called his mom and he asked her if she would come pick him up at the gas station just down the road from the house he was at. His mother would say it was obvious Dylan had been drinking because he was slurring his words, but at the time, even though she was upset about it because he was underage, she thought, you know what, it's cold, it's snowing, I just want to get my kid home safe and we'll deal with this tomorrow. So she agreed to pick him up. She hopped in the car and began driving to this gas station, and as she's driving, she gets another call from her son. This time, he sounds totally panicked and scared, and he's asking his mom, you know, where are you? Where are you, mom? And she's telling him, I'm going to be there in a minute. I'm just down the road. Calm down. I'll be there in a minute. And then he hung up. When she got to the gas station, he wasn't there. When she tried calling him back, his phone was off. She got out of the car and went into the gas station and asked if they'd seen her son, and they said they hadn't. She got back in the car and she drove around for about 30 minutes yelling for her son, but there was no sign of him. She still couldn't get in touch with him. His phone was still off, and she just had this bad feeling that something had happened to him, so she called the police. The police conducted a thorough search that started with the house Dylan had been at for this party. They interviewed the people who were there, and everybody said Dylan seemed fine, and he just left. He said he was getting picked up by his mom. But as they looked around town, they just could not find any sign of him. Ten days later, Dylan's body was found in an area nobody was searching. In fact, he was found by accident by two people that crashed their ATVs in the middle of the night and then went back in the daytime the next day to retrieve their ATVs, and that's when they found Dylan's body. He was located outside of town, high up a hill in a dense forest, which in order to get there, he would have had to walk the opposite direction of the gas station. Now, toxicology reports showed Dylan had been under the influence of alcohol, but this was his hometown. He certainly knew where the gas station was, and he would have known he was walking in the complete wrong direction, especially when you consider walking towards the gas station was like walking towards the center of town. There was lots of lights, lots of indication you're going in the right direction. To walk in the other direction towards that hill where he was found would have been like walking towards darkness, where there's no lights, there's no sign of town. It's obviously the wrong direction. But the case gets even stranger, because on the day Dylan went missing, there was a lot of snow on the ground, which meant people would have made tracks. And from the time Dylan went missing until he was found, it didn't snow, and the temperature did not heat up enough to melt the snow. So in theory, any tracks Dylan would have made, they would still be there when he was found. But where Dylan was found, there were no tracks anywhere near him. No footprints, no tire tracks, nothing. It was as if someone had dropped him out of the sky. Another strange element of this case is Dylan was found without pants and without boots on. And so you would think for him to make it all the way up to this spot on the hillside through kind of rough, rocky, snowy terrain through a forest that you would expect his socks to be totally ruined and his feet to potentially be cut up but his socks were clean and his feet were uninjured. This led investigators to believe Dylan must have somehow made his way to that spot on the hillside in that forest without leaving any tracks. And then once he was there, he removed his pants and his boots. Except dozens of police officers and sniffer dogs were never able to find those pants and boots, despite the fact they should, in theory, be in that immediate area where he took them off. While he determined Dylan's cause of death to be hypothermia, the deputy coroner, David Roos, was convinced there was something off about this case. After local authorities came out and said Dylan's death was an accident, David became very vocal in the media saying he disagreed and he thought Dylan had been attacked. But the county never reinvestigated Dylan's case, and in fact, they went on to fire David Roos, the coroner, saying he was no longer qualified to do the job. David says they fired him to keep him quiet. As a result, we may never know the truth about what happened to Dylan. Dustin Self was born and raised in Piedmont, Oklahoma, which is a small community just northwest of Oklahoma City. Growing up, Dustin had always been kind of a mediocre performer with so-so grades, didn't take things too seriously, but in his senior year, he discovered weightlifting, and it seemed to give his life a much-needed sense of purpose, and it really kind of helped him organize all aspects of his life. So by the time he was graduating, he was not only in great physical shape, he had also managed to raise all of his grades up significantly, and he seemed to be on a path to success. But interestingly, after high school, he didn't pursue higher education, he didn't go get a job, he didn't try to spend more time with friends and family. Instead, he decided he wanted to go live in the wild. His family believed this was due to his obsession with the Hollywood film Into the Wild, which is about the true story of Christopher McCandless, who gives up a promising career to go live off in the wilds of Alaska. Christopher would ultimately die in the wilds of Alaska after eating a poisonous plant 
or some say he died from starvation. So about a year after Dustin's high school graduation, he was 19 years old, it was March of 2013, and he finally felt like he was ready to go live out this dream of living in the wild. And so he told his family he was gonna go on this cross country road trip, stopping at different points along the way, living out in the woods. His family knew he was really fixated on this and couldn't talk him out of it, and so they ultimately accepted it and said, just be really careful. So in early March, Dustin heads out on this road trip and nobody hears from him until March 15th when he calls his parents and says, I'm in this tiny town called Fields, Oregon, and I'm at a gas station. Everything's going great, nothing to worry about. The very next day, Dustin called his ex-girlfriend and told her he was lost on a mountain. And his ex-girlfriend said she couldn't really understand what he was saying, and she was actually at the airport about to board a plane, so it was noisy, and she stepped into a bathroom to hear him more clearly, but even as she's hearing him, what he was saying just wasn't making any sense. He was talking about this mountain he was lost on, and he was referencing that there were people that were after him, and it was just very confusing. And before she could get any more clarifying information from Dustin, he hung up, and then she couldn't get back in touch with him. So she calls Dustin's father and she tells him that she had this really weird conversation with Dustin where he said he's lost on this mountain. And even though I didn't really understand what he was telling me, he sounded really, really scared. Dustin's father thanked her and then spent the rest of the day trying to get in touch with the son. But every time he called, it just went straight to voicemail. The next day, when he still hadn't heard from his son, he called the police. The police did not have a great idea of where to start looking for him because Dustin did not specify to his ex-girlfriend what mountain he was actually lost on. All they had was his last known location, which was that gas station in Fields, Oregon. So they went to that gas station and he wasn't there. And they asked the people that worked there if they remembered Dustin and they didn't and no one knew anything about him. And so after that, they just had to wait for more leads to come in because they couldn't just, you know, search all the mountains in Oregon for Dustin. They would never find him. A month later, after no one's heard from Dustin, a ranch hand who was living in a very rural section of Oregon, not far from the gas station in Fields, Oregon, discovered Dustin's truck parked precariously on the edge of this road inside of a canyon. It was abandoned, but inside were Dustin's GPS, some food, and some energy drinks. His backpack that contained his sleeping bag and his tent were missing. There was a comprehensive search done around where the truck had been found, but after a couple of days, nothing had been found and the search was terminated. The area around where Dustin's truck was found was very hilly and rocky, but there weren't that many trees, which meant if you were standing on one of the different mountains in the area, you'd be able to very easily look out and actually see a road. And so the searchers were thinking to themselves, how could this guy have gotten lost on any of these mountains? Because all he'd have to do is look over there and there's a road and therefore there's help. Six months later, a hunter was up in those mountains near where Dustin's truck was found and he was actually moving through one of these small sections of aspen trees. And as he was walking through, he thought he saw a deer and he was kind of stalking through these trees. And he gets to an opening where he looks down and he stops because underneath the bush is an obviously dead man, not wearing any clothes, who's on his hands and knees. And it looks like his head is stuck in the ground. When the hunter walks over to get a better look, it looks like this guy must have pushed his head into a hole in the ground before he succumbed to whatever killed him. The hunter leaves and tells police, police show up, they search the area and they find a jacket nearby inside of which is a wallet that contains Dustin's ID cards as well as Dustin's car keys. The body was Dustin's. Dustin was located nine miles away from where his truck had been parked on that road and nowhere in the area did they find a campsite. They actually never found his backpack that contained the tent or the sleeping bag so they think he never set up camp but they don't know where his supplies went. After Dustin's family found out what happened to him his father would say I just don't understand why he didn't seek shelter in his vehicle. It was parked on the road. He wasn't that far away. Heck, he could have run those nine miles. He was in great physical shape. And in theory, he would have known where he parked it. Or if he didn't, he could have just walked to the edge of the mountain and looked out and seen the road it was parked on. So the family just couldn't understand his decision making. Investigators would say there was no indication Dustin was trying to hurt himself and foul play was ruled out. So what was it that caused Dustin to abandon his car and walk nine miles uphill and ditch his clothes and ditch his backpack that contained his tent and his sleeping bag and then stick his head in a hole until he died? The only thing that could be determined was that Dustin probably died of hypothermia, but because of the state his body was in from decomposition, the coroner said, we don't know for sure. So like all the other missing 411 cases, we're left with lots of questions and not a lot of answers. In 2010, Jan McAbee was living with her husband, Bruce, in a town called Lima, Ohio, which is approximately 80 miles southwest of Lake Erie. 
While Jan had built a successful career as a booking agent for musicians, bands, and entertainers, her real passion was deer hunting. So on September 29th of that year, right after deer hunting season had opened in Ohio, Jan decided to go out on a hunt. That morning had been cold and damp and gray, but by that afternoon, when Jan was getting ready to go, the temperatures had risen and the sun had come out. Jan's preferred method of hunting was to sit and watch from a tree stand, which is a ladder that you put in the woods that sits about 15 feet high. She would sit up there with her bow and arrow and wait to take a shot when a deer came by. Around 5 p.m. that day, she told Bruce she was leaving and she made it to her tree stand by about 5.30. The forest she was going to be hunting in was one she was very familiar with, and it was not very remote. There were a couple houses just outside the woods, there were some agricultural areas, and her nephew actually went to high school just a mile north of these woods. But from the tree stand where she was sitting, all she could see around her was trees. Shortly after Jan sat down, she started texting with one of her friends on her Blackberry, and periodically she'd poke her head up and look for deer, there weren't any, and then she'd go back to texting. The whole time this is happening, Jan can hear birds and crickets and squirrels and all the sounds of the forest all around her. A little after 6 p.m., her texting conversation with her friend reached a natural conclusion, and so she went back to just kind of sitting in the tree stand looking around. By about 6.20 p.m., she still hadn't seen any deer and she was starting to get bored, so she decided she would take a selfie. She picked up her Blackberry, she took the selfie, and as soon as she was done, she became aware that the forest had suddenly gone completely quiet. No more squirrels, no more birds, no more crickets, just complete silence. And she knew as a hunter, the only time this happened was when a large predator was in the area and all the other animals went quiet. But Jan would later say there was just something different about this silence. It was so sudden and so complete that it scared her. And she wound up sending another text message to that friend she'd been texting earlier that said the woods just went completely silent very odd. As soon as Jan hit send on that text message and lowered her phone, she immediately became aware of something about 20 feet away in the tree that was right across from her. And she said it was the most unusual and terrifying thing she had ever seen. Moving left to right through the branches was this thing that she described as like a visual distortion. She said it was like looking across pavement on a really hot day and seeing that mirage, except this one looked like it was alive, like it had mass, like it was a a see-through person that had been wrapped in saran wrap. And so Jan thinks it's a floater in her eyes, and so she rubs her eyes, and when she looks up, this thing has now moved down a branch closer to her and has stopped, like it's perched on the branch, staring at her, and Jan's horrified, but she knows she wants to document it, so she grabs her phone and she raises it up and she takes a picture on her Blackberry right as this thing kind of disappears behind the tree and vanishes. Just seconds after this thing disappeared, all the sounds in the forest came back. The birds, the squirrels, the crickets, it was all back to normal, but Jan was really shaken up because she just could not make sense of what she just saw. So she just continued to stare in the general direction of where this thing was for several minutes until finally she felt like it was safe again, at which point she brought her phone up to look at the picture she had taken. When she looked at it, it looked like a blurry mess. And so she thought, oh, I blew it. I put my hand over it or my hair got in the way of it or something. But at the same time, she's thinking to herself, but my hair didn't get in the way of it. And I very clearly held it out in front of me and know that I was looking at my phone when I took it and I had a clear shot of this thing. So I don't really understand how this photo got so messed up. But after looking at the picture for a little while, she started to kind of laugh at herself. You know, the idea that she'd just seen a saran wrap person running through the treetops. You know, she just felt like that that didn't happen. It must have been in my head. And as for this picture, I probably just blocked the lens and, and that's it. That night when Jan got back to her house, she did not tell her husband Bruce about what happened to her in the tree stand because again, she's telling herself it was all in her head. They have dinner, they clean up, they sit down in the living room and they're both on their phones and they're just kind of scrolling through the internet and their emails. And at some point, Bruce reacts to something he's reading. He makes a sound and Jan hears him and says, oh, what are you looking at? And he said, you know, I just got a really interesting email from our nephew, you know, the one that goes to school down the road. He said that today they were outside for band practice and at some point all of them turned to look at the forest and there was a bright circular light that was kind of hovering in the forest. And I guess they all stared at it for about five or 10 seconds. And then at some point the light kind of went back into the forest and they didn't know what to make of it. And I guess one of his classmates said that a year before the exact same thing happened 
and it apparently scared their instructor so badly that they canceled rehearsal and went inside because of it. As Jan is listening to her husband read this email, she's sitting up and her heart is racing, and as soon as he finishes, she says, what time did he say that happened? Bruce picked up how intensely she was asking him, and so he looked at the email, looked back at his wife, and was like, it was between 7.50 and 8. Why? At this point, Jan revealed everything that had happened to her while she was hunting, you know, seeing that visual distortion in the trees that looked like a figure of some kind. And she would tell him that the forest she was in was the same one their nephew was claiming to have seen this circular light floating inside of. She told him she tried to take a picture of the thing she saw, but the picture didn't come out. But her husband, who is an optical physicist and therefore an expert at analyzing a picture, said, here, let me take a look at it. As soon as he looked at the image, the first thing he asked her was, well, did your hair get in front of the lens? And she said, no, I was holding it about a foot away from my head and my hair was in a ponytail and a ball cap, so that can't be my hair. And so he looked at it again and he asked her, well, did you put your finger over the lens maybe? And she said, yeah, I might have. I don't think I did, but it's certainly possible. And so not really thinking much of this picture, he decides before giving the phone back to just check the resolution of the image because whenever he would examine a picture, that was something he would do, and he discovered an anomaly. It turns out Jan's BlackBerry was only capable of taking pictures in three distinct resolutions. Basically, the size of the image could only come in small, medium, or large. And this picture she had taken of this thing she saw in the trees was a resolution size that was not small, medium, or large. It was some random size that the phone was actually not capable of producing. And so he asked his wife, like, did you manipulate your resolution settings? And she said, no, I don't even know how to do that. So Bruce looked at the other couple of pictures she had taken that day, and all of those fell into the small, medium, or large resolution size. It was just this one picture that was a total anomaly. And so Bruce was suddenly really intrigued by this image and by his wife's story, and so he continued to study the image, and he kept asking his wife questions about, you know, how she was positioned in the tree stand, and where the sun was, and how far away this thing was, and everything about the whole layout. And eventually, Bruce started conducting experiments to see if he could duplicate this image his wife had created. And he got pretty scientific about it, and he could not duplicate it. Ultimately, because Bruce trusts his wife did not alter the photo in any way, and he trusts his wife as being truthful about what she experienced in the tree stand, you know, what she saw, and based on his years of being an optical physicist, Bruce believes whatever was in the trees distorted this image. That even if she had put her finger over the lens, which he doesn't think she did, and she doesn't think she did, the picture resolution was altered in such a way that something had to have an effect on it. There was a third party effect on this picture. If you're interested in reading all of Bruce's scientific findings about this picture, I have included his write-up that he posted online in the sources below. In 1983, 23-year-old Tammy Ashcroft was engaged to 34-year-old Richard Sharp. The couple had bonded over their shared love of sailing, and generally they spent more time on the water than on land. In October of that year, a friend approached the couple and asked if they'd be willing to take their 44-foot yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. Though the trip would be over 4,000 miles long, significantly longer than any one trip either of them had ever taken on the open water, they both felt very confident in their seafaring abilities, and so they agreed to do it. The journey started out fine, but at the two-week mark, when they were just north of the equator, they heard about a hurricane that could be making its way up to where they were going. And so even though they anticipated it would kind of peter out and actually not even hit them, they decided it was still in their best interest to try to sail completely away from the path of the storm to safer waters. But over the next couple of days, the storm only intensified and continued to change directions, making it really hard to predict where safer waters was going to be. And so Tammy and Richard kept desperately trying to get farther and farther away from the storm, but it was like every time they would change course and get farther away, the storm would speed up and change directions and still be coming straight for them. And so finally, it got to the point where Tammy and Richard realized they could not actually outpace the storm, that they would have to weather it. And so on the day it was going to hit them, they don't onto their rain gear and they boarded up the windows and then they stood on the deck of their yacht looking out at the horizon as this category four hurricane is just barreling straight towards them. Tammy would go on to say that she never fully appreciated just how terrifying being in a hurricane is 
out at sea until she was in one. She said it was a constant barrage of 50 foot waves that would literally launch the yacht. It would become airborne and then it would come crashing down. And each time it landed, she felt like the boat was gonna break in two. And then as soon as it did slam down, another wave would land on top of them. And so it just felt like at any moment, the ship was just gonna be consumed by the ocean. But Tammy and Richard were excellent sailors and Richard was up in the cockpit and he was doing everything he could to keep the boat from not flipping over. And after a little while, he had figured out a way to kind of ride the waves in such a way that they would not get totally tossed each time. And after a couple hours of just absolute chaos, it started to seem like they had made it through the worst of the storm and that more than likely they were going to make it out of this thing relatively unharmed. And so around this time, as the storm was beginning to calm down, Richard is anchored in place in the cockpit. He's a safety line attached to him to the ground, so he's not going anywhere. And Tammy is just exhausted. It was just so stressful being through the storm. And Richard noticed and he says, Tammy, I got this up here. Go down into the cabin and just try to get some rest. And Tammy was very grateful and she agreed. She opened the doors to the cabin and she had made it all the way downstairs when she hears Richard yell out from up in the cockpit, oh my God, before a rogue wave comes crashing into their boat head on, flipping the boat backwards like a backflip onto the top. So it's upside down in the water. And Tammy would say it felt like someone ripped the boat out from under her feet. And then she came crashing down and smashed her head and was knocked unconscious. When Tammy woke up 27 hours later, she was laying in the cabin against a chair and half on the ground. And she opens her eyes and the cabin she's in is half submerged and everything inside of it has either been thrown on the ground or it's been broken. There's papers, there's tools. I mean, the place is just a disaster down there. And she can tell the cabin is also slowly filling with water. After the boat had backflipped and Tammy had been knocked unconscious, it continued to get thrown around by waves before miraculously landing upright. Tammy could barely remember what happened and she's totally overwhelmed by what she's seeing. She's in shock and all she knows is she has to go up on deck to find Richard. And so she gets up and wades through the water. She gets to the stairs. She's yelling for Richard. She goes up on deck and she looked around and the boat was just ruined and she's yelling for Richard. She's looking around. He's nowhere to be found. And then she looks up at the cockpit where she she last saw him and she can see his safety line that was attached to him keeping him anchored to the boat was now dangling off the back of the boat she ran to the back she looked and the safety harness had actually come undone it had been broken in the storm and Richard was gone he had been swept into the ocean and he was not wearing a life jacket and Tammy would say he had actually taken it off earlier in the storm and left it down in the cabin and then when the storm was raging again he was back up top anchored in place and just didn't think to go down and get it and they both were just not not thinking about it. It was just one of those things in a really chaotic situation that got overlooked. And while Tammy wanted to grieve the loss of her fiance, it was like she couldn't. Her survival instincts were kicking in and she knew if she didn't act quickly to fix this situation, she too would die. And so she began robotically taking stock of the boat's condition and she saw the masts had broken clean off, the sails were now dragging in the water, the engine, the radio, the electronic navigation system, the emergency position indicator device, all of it was ruined. And so all alone in the middle of the ocean with nothing in sight, no ships, no land, no anything, on a ruined ship that is gradually sinking after finding out your fiance has been swept out to his death in the middle of a storm, Tammy managed to stay composed and she built a makeshift sail and began sailing the ship and she also began slowly pumping the water out of the cabin. She went back into the cabin and she discovered some of the almanacs were still in there and she discovered there was a current that she thought she could get to and so using just a sextant and a watch she manually navigated this broken down ship using this makeshift sail into this current and then for 41 days she survived on canned food and peanut butter and she sailed 50 1500 miles to Hawaii and the whole time she's thinking to herself if my calculations are off that this is not the current I'm supposed to be in I will sail past Hawaii out into the open water and I will run out of food and water and I will die but she didn't die because her calculations were spot on. When Tammy finally stepped foot on land in Hawaii, she was relieved that, you know, she had made it and that she was gonna live. But at the same time, she had this flood of emotions where she was suddenly so sad about the loss of Richard. It was like she really hadn't had a chance to grieve his loss because that whole time after the accident, she was focused on survival. And although Tammy would make a full recovery, it 
would take her six years to learn how to read again because of the head injury she sustained when the boat capsized. But when she did regain that skill, she finally stopped and she wrote her and Richard's story in a book called Red Sky and Morning that became an international bestseller and was converted into a movie called Adrift. Growing up in southeastern Australia, Ricky McGee worked a variety of jobs, including being a carpet salesman, a prawn fisherman, a nightclub doorman, an electrician, and a bailiff. In 2006, when Ricky was 35, he was offered yet another new job in a government department in western Australia. He accepted the job, hopped in his car, and began the long drive across the desert. While on the extremely desolate Buntine Highway, which is basically a road in the middle of the desert with nothing around, no people, no buildings, nothing, He's driving along and he sees a group of three men standing outside of their car. And so Ricky assumed they must have broken down. So he pulls over to ask if they need help. And they come up to him and they're, they're so gracious that he stopped. And they said, we ran out of gas. Can we hop in with you and ride up to the next town? And Ricky says, fine, climb on in. So the three men, they get in his car and they take off. And then after that, Ricky has no memory. He thinks one of them drugged him by putting something in his drink, which was sitting in the center console and was open, but he doesn't know for sure. Ricky remembers waking up and and he was in a camp and he sat up and he was unrestrained and he looks out in front of him and the three guys that had gotten in the car with him were sitting on rocks looking at him and one of them had a gun that he was aiming at Ricky. And so Ricky's just looking around, not really sure what's going on and one of them gets up and comes over and offers him water. Ricky takes a sip of the water because he's very thirsty and Ricky believes the water was poisoned as well because shortly after taking a sip, he passed out again. When Ricky regained consciousness a second time, he couldn't move. It was dark and he felt something tugging at his skin. And as he's laying there, he realizes there is black plastic right over his face. He's been buried. And then he realizes there is a dingo that is standing on his chest that has tugged the plastic away from his face because the dog is trying to take a bite out of Ricky. But the dog is the one that saved his life by creating an air pocket in the plastic. Ricky screamed at the dog. The dog panicked and leapt out of the hole and ran away. And Ricky was able to work his finger up to this hole and pull it all the way open and push himself out of the plastic. And he realized there wasn't much dirt or rocks that had been placed over him. They probably thought he would just suffocate in the middle of the desert and no one's gonna find him anyways, but here he is. And so he stands up in his grave and he looks around and there's no sign of the three men. His car is gone. He realizes they also took all of his clothing, even his shoes. He's got no food, he's got no water. He's in the middle of the desert. There's no roads, there's no people, there's no buildings, there's nothing. At this point, confusion overtook Ricky because he just could not make sense of what had just happened to him. Who were these three people? Why'd they attack him? Did they just wanna steal his car? Were they prepared to kill him? To take his car he just he couldn't understand it and so there was some shade behind a little bush and he sat down in the shade and he just sat there for several hours thinking you know what am i gonna do but not being one to let pessimism crowd his psyche ricky decides if he's gonna survive he needs to get up and get moving after 10 days of just wandering through the desert and seeing nobody he came across this fairly large water hole and he decided you know what i have a better chance of surviving if i just wait here until someone comes and rescues me than if i just keep walking walking through the desert where I'm bound to just eventually die. And so he makes a makeshift shelter next to this water hole and he begins to wait. After almost a week of being at the spot, Ricky had still not had a single thing to eat since this whole ordeal began. And so he's sitting there, his stomach is in knots, he's in so much pain, he's starving. And just then a lizard happened to run across in front of him and without even thinking, he just reached out and grabbed it and took a bite out of it. And it was like all of a sudden this primal side of him was unleashed and suddenly he had no issues eating anything that moved in the desert. For weeks, Ricky stayed at the spot Spot, drinking from the water hole and eating lizards, frogs, leeches, snakes, grasshoppers, caterpillars, basically anything that moved anywhere in the desert, he would chase it down and he would eat it. In fact, he developed an affinity for certain frogs over others. And he said in terms of eating leeches that they were okay, but you needed to eat them really, really quickly. Otherwise they would attach to the insides of your mouth. Ricky also ate plants, but he would even say he had no idea what was harmful and what was okay to eat. He just ate what tasted good and got really lucky. But as much as Ricky was eating, it wasn't enough. He was slowly losing his battle with the desert and he was starving to death. And so Ricky believed he didn't have enough time to just continue to wait at this particular spot. He needed to go out and find help. And so he left that water hole and began stumbling through the desert all over again. But he was so weak, he only lasted for a couple of days before he found another water hole and he stopped there and he built yet another shelter, this time believing it would become his tomb. Over the next couple of days, wild dogs began coming 
coming to his camp and circling his camp. It was like they knew he was about to die soon, or they at least knew he was weak enough they could probably overpower him soon. At night, Ricky had to barricade the door of his shelter because the dogs would get aggressive and they'd come up to the door and try to paw their way inside. On the 70th day of his ordeal, Ricky believed he was probably within a day or two of passing away. And so he put a cross on the outside of his shelter, believing that would be his tomb. And at least this way, someone might notice it and find his body and then hopefully let his family know what happened to him. But on the 71st day, when Ricky happened to be standing outside of his shelter, two ranch hands happened to be way off the road in the outback and were looking in his direction and they saw him. And when they went over to him, they said he looked like a walking skeleton and Ricky practically collapsed as soon as he saw help had finally arrived. The ranch hands evacuated Ricky from the desert and brought him to a hospital where he weighed less than 100 pounds. At the beginning of his ordeal, he weighed over 230 pounds. Despite filing a report with the police about the three men who attacked him, they were never caught. Ricky checked himself out of the hospital after six days and made a full recovery. He ended up writing a book about his experience and he now works construction in Dubai. By 1985, the remote and extremely dangerous west face of the Ciula Grande in the Peruvian Andes was still unclimbed. But in 1985, two very ambitious climbers, 25-year-old Joe Simpson and 21-year-old Simon Yates, decided they were going to be the first to conquer it. And by all accounts, they seemed up for the job, having already conquered numerous difficult Scottish ice cliffs, as well as a number of large mountain faces in the Alps. So in early June of that year, the pair flew to Peru and they arrived at the base camp that it was nearest to the Ciula Grande, but it was still five miles away, so they couldn't actually see what they were going to be climbing yet. On June 5th, when the weather was good enough, the pair left camp and worked their way around the huge lake across the glacier to the base of this cliff they're about to climb, and when they saw it for the first time, they couldn't believe how steep and dangerous it looked. But over the next three days, they managed to make it up this cliff despite a blizzard hitting them halfway through, and they reached the summit. To them, this was a crowning achievement. They had done it. They had written their names in the history books. But in reality, the thing that people would remember them for was not for reaching the top of Ciula Grande. It was for what happened when they started going down. Because of how steep this mountain was, and because of the blizzard that was not going away, it was actually getting worse, the descent was going to be much more challenging than the ascent. So shortly after 10 a.m. on June 8th, Joe and Simon left the summit and began very carefully making their way down the mountain. At 11 a.m., disaster struck when Joe lost his footing and fell to the bottom of an ice cliff and shattered his leg. Initially, they both assumed this was a death sentence for Joe because there's no way he can actually climb down the mountain now, and certainly Simon can't actually carry him down the mountain. They were so high up, and it's so steep. There's just no way. But Simon wanted to at least try to save his friend, so he climbed down to him. He gave him some mild painkillers that he had, and then he attached his rope to Joe, and then Simon anchored himself in the snow, and he began lowering Joe down the mountain, all 300 feet of his rope. And when he would stop, Joe at the other end would anchor himself in the snow with his ice picks, and then Simon would climb down to Joe and he'd repeat the process over and over and over again, lowering Joe 300 feet at a time. This went on for hours and hours and hours, just backbreaking work for Simon. And Joe, meanwhile, is in excruciating pain from his broken leg. And to make matters worse, the storm had gotten so bad that the visibility between Simon and Joe was zero. So as Simon is lowering Joe, he can't see what he's lowering Joe onto, but they had no other choice. That was the only way they could get him down. And so at 5 p.m. that night, Simon accidentally lowers Joe over a cliff. And Joe, as soon as he's hanging off the edge, all of his weight is on the rope, and suddenly the rope is flying out of Simon's hands, and he manages to self-arrest and stop him from careening over the edge. But now, Simon is the only thing holding Joe from tumbling to his death. And Simon is being slowly drugged down the mountain. He can't anchor himself in. And so they're in the middle of this inhospitable environment in the middle of the night. A storm is raging. It's freezing cold. They can't communicate with each other. They can't hear each other or see each other. And Simon is just hoping that Joe is going to be able to grab onto something and kind of take his weight off the rope. Otherwise, this is going to end badly for both of them. But unfortunately, the cliff was at an angle. So Joe was dangling off of it and he couldn't touch the wall. He had nothing to grab onto. 
to. He was just dangling in the air. And so as Simon tries to move the rope to try to signal to Joe to take your weight off the rope, Joe is trying to climb up the rope, but his hands are starting to get frostbit. He's weak, he's in pain, he can't do anything about it. So for the next two and a half hours, Simon is desperately trying to regain an anchor in the snow, but every second that goes by, he's getting pulled farther and farther and farther down the mountain. He can't see how close he is to the edge. He knows he's getting close. And so finally at 7.30 p.m. with no other option, he pulls out a knife and he cuts the rope. As soon as the rope was cut, Simon fell backwards. He was safe. Nothing was pulling him off the cliff any longer, but he knew he had just sent Joe to his death. Except Joe didn't die. When that rope was cut, he fell 150 feet and smashed into the ground, except what he hit was a thin sheet of ice that broke from his weight, and he fell another 80 feet into this massive ice crevasse. Joe was knocked unconscious from the fall, but when he woke up, he was laying on his side. He opened his eyes and he looked around and he couldn't believe he was alive. And he's looking around, he doesn't know where he is, it's totally dark. He turns on his headlamp and he realizes he's fallen into an ice crevasse and he looks down and he's on this little ledge that's overlooking a much, much deeper fall. He looks down and this ice crevasse seems to just go on infinitely into this black chasm. And he realizes when he fell, had he fallen a foot over, that's where he would have gone. So it's a miracle he's alive, but now he's trapped in the middle of an ice crevasse 80 feet down. He can't go down and he can't go up. At the time, Joe didn't know if Simon had fallen off the cliff with him or if he had cut the rope but the rope was still attached to his waist and it fed up and out of the ice crevasse. And so he grabbed it and pulled on it until it all came tumbling back down and he saw it was frayed. And so sure enough, Simon had cut the rope. Now, even though Joe wasn't mad at Simon for the decision he made because he understood it was the right one, Joe still became very emotional when he saw this. He felt so alone, he was so sad. And for a little while, he just kind of freaked out and screamed and yelled and really just didn't know what he was gonna do. And then after that, he sat down knowing he wasn't getting out of here and that he was gonna die a slow, horrible, painful death. Joe remembers reaching up and turning off his headlamp, which retrospectively he thought was kind of goofy because he's just realized he's about to die inside of this crevasse and he's saving batteries. But with the light off, he's sitting on the ledge and he hears all the sounds that are coming from inside of this crevasse. It was this awful grinding sound, like a moaning sound. And he said it was so terrifying sitting in the darkness, listening to the sound that he reached up and turned his light back on just for comfort. Back up on the mountain, Simon was devastated. He felt like he had just killed his friend. And even though he understood why he did it and understood it was probably the right decision, it didn't change the fact that he felt incredibly guilty about it. And so that night he didn't even move from the position he was. He dug a little snow cave and he laid down and eventually fell asleep. The next morning when he got up, he began moving his way down the mountain and he finally rounded the area where Joe had been hanging off of that cliff and he got a chance to look down and see where Joe might have wound up. And to his horror, he's looking down and he sees this massive opening to a crevasse that seemed almost bottomless. And now this confirms that Joe definitely has died because he fell in there. But nonetheless, Simon goes down and goes to the edge of the crevasse and yells into Joe. He's screaming for him to call out if he's still alive. But after a while, he never heard anything from Joe. And with a heavy heart, Simon turned around and started heading back to base camp. A little while after Simon had left, Joe finally woke up. He had been asleep when Simon was yelling down for him. And so Joe wakes up, he's looking around, he can't believe this wasn't a bad dream. He starts yelling for Simon because he doesn't know what else to do. But after a while, he realized Simon's not gonna come down here to get me. He cut the rope, he thinks I'm dead already. At this point, Joe decides he needs to try to climb out of the crevasse, even with a broken leg. And so he gets himself in position, he gets his ice picks, and he starts making his way up this ice wall, but he can't put any weight on his broken leg and he keeps falling down. And he's realizing, I can't climb this. I probably couldn't climb this with two good legs, let alone with this broken one. And so Joe had two choices. He could wait on the ledge and hope to be rescued, but by his calculations, it was unlikely someone was gonna come out here and rescue him anytime soon because Simon is gonna say he's dead. So wait on the ledge and probably die a slow, painful death or he can go down deeper into the crevasse, which he has no idea where it goes, and hope somewhere down in that black void, there's an opening that leads back out to the outside of the mountain. So he made his choice, screwed an anchor into the ice, put his rope through it. He tested it to make sure it would hold his weight. 
He looked down into the void one last time and knew that as soon as he stepped off of this ledge, he could not come back up again. This was a one-way trip. And if he made it to the bottom of his 300-foot rope and he didn't find a ledge or a tunnel or something to put his feet on, he would slip off and fall to his death on purpose. He did not put a knot at the end of his rope because he figured either I'll find a way out or I won't, but at least it'll be quick. Down he went about 80 feet into this pitch black crevasse. He has no idea what's down there. And he gets to a point where the walls kind of come together and he was able to squeeze through it. And he realized once he got through that point, it was like the center of an hourglass where below it, it kind of opened up. And as soon as he pushed through, he could actually see to the ground. He saw flat ground and there was light shining on it, which meant there was a hole leading out into the mountains somewhere down there. And so he went all the way down, he touched the bottom, it was solid ground, he disconnected from his rope, and he climbed his way up this incline to where the sun was coming in, which was this hole that led right back out onto the mountain. And sure enough, he crawled out and tumbled out, and the sun is shining on him, and he remembers just laying on the mountain, looking at the sun, and laughing. He couldn't believe it. But after the initial relief of not dying wore off, he realized he was not out of the woods yet. He still needed to climb down the rest of the mountain, and there wasn't that much left to climb. He was towards the bottom, and it wasn't that steep. But after that, he would need to navigate five miles back to base camp. But over several delirious, painful, miserable days, he managed to crawl all the way back to base camp, and he got there right as Simon was packing up the tent and getting ready to leave. He could not believe he saw Joe alive. Joe said Simon just swore. He just endlessly swore. He was cussing. He he couldn't even speak. He didn't understand. It was like he was looking at a ghost. But after that kind of crazy initial interaction, Simon just gave Joe a big hug and Joe and Simon just cried and held each other. Joe underwent six surgical operations to repair the damage done to his leg and doctors would tell him that you're never going to climb again and you're probably going to struggle with walking for the rest of your life. But after two years of intense rehabilitation, Joe was not only walking just fine, he was mountain climbing. As for Simon, he managed to leave the mountain without any serious physical injury, but he carried with him an enormous sense of guilt that he still carries today. Joe consistently says Simon made the right decision, and every interview he does, he always makes sure to say Simon is not at fault. It was an impossible situation. He made the right call. Joe wrote a book about the experience called Touching the Void, and it sold millions of copies worldwide and has since been adapted into a major motion picture. As for Joe and Simon, apparently they've drifted apart over the years, but they still consider each other friends. West Townshend is a rural area on the east side of Glastonbury Mountain in the American state of Vermont. This is significant because that places West Townshend in the so-called Bennington Triangle, which is apparently one of the most haunted places in America. The Triangle is a loosely defined area that encompasses the ghost town Glastonbury, which used to be a small logging community centered on the eponymous mountain in southwestern Vermont. The town was abandoned at the end of the 19th century after the logging boom died down, so as a result, the greater Glastonbury area that West Townshend is certainly a part of is now untouched pristine wilderness that even by Vermont standards is incredibly rugged and remote. The triangle has earned its spooky reputation due in large part to the alarming number of unexplained disappearances that have occurred there over the last 100 years. Furthermore, over those 100 years, there have been dozens of sightings of the so-called Bennington monster, which is apparently this eight foot tall creature that roams the mountains of Glastonbury and some people people think that creature is behind many, if not all, of these strange disappearances. On November 23rd, 1943, 37-year-old Carl Herrick and his cousin Henry decided to go to West Townshend to do some deer hunting. At some point during their hunt, the pair got separated, and Henry spent some time yelling for Carl and looking around for him, but he couldn't find him, and so he assumed he must have gone back to their camp. But when Henry got back to camp, it was empty, and Henry waited around for a little while for Carl, but he had this sinking feeling that something was wrong, and so relatively quickly, he left to get police. Police show up, they launch the search. For three days, they combed the entire area, and there was just not a sign of Carl anywhere. On the third day, Henry discovered Carl's body. He was lying motionless, face down, in a clearing in the woods. Initially, Henry thought maybe he was still alive, so he ran over to him and rolled him over, and very quickly realized that no, Carl was deceased. 
However, there weren't any obvious injuries to Carl's body. He had some minor scratching on his arms and on his hands, but that was about it. Henry looked around the area and he found Carl's rifle that was loaded leaning up against a tree 70 feet away from where Carl was. Next to his rifle on the ground was an expended shell casing. Also, around Carl's body were apparently huge bear tracks. The official cause of death was baffling. Carl, apparently, was squeezed to death to the point where his rib broke and punctured his lung. So the theory became, Carl must have been out here by himself, he encountered a black bear, he fired one shot at the black bear, thinking it was down, he walked over to check, and the bear attacked him and squeezed him and killed him, the end. But not so fast. If Carl encountered a black bear and fired one shot into the animal based on the one found shell casing, that one shot is not gonna be enough to put that animal down, or very rarely is one shot gonna be enough to put down a black bear. And Carl, being a hunter, he would know that, and he would wanna keep some distance with his weapon up aimed at the animal in case he needed to fire again. But even if Carl was really confident that one shot had taken the bear down, well, why would he risk his life by checking on the animal to make sure it's down without his gun? Why did he place it against a tree and then walk 70 feet over to this animal that if it's not dead, it poses an enormous threat to you? You're all alone and unarmed with a huge bear that you've shot? No one's gonna do that. You're gonna carry your gun. But even if all of that happened, that Carl unarmed approached this bear thinking it was dead, but the bear's not dead, he's lying in wait and he leaps up and attacks Carl. Even if that happened, black bears don't squeeze people to death. They might scratch you and bite you and rip you to pieces, but they don't squeeze you to death. And Carl only had light scratching on his wrists and on his hands. He did not have any signs of a traditional bear attack. So either this is the first time in the history of black bears that a black bear squeezed a person to death or something else squeezed Carl. But what kind of an animal is one so strong it can squeeze a man's chest to the point where it breaks his ribs and two happens to be roaming around the Bennington Triangle? Makes you wonder. Ape Canyon is a gorge on the southeast portion of Mount St. Helens in the American state of Washington. The canyon is so named after a group of miners alleged that ape men, aka Bigfoot, attacked their cabin there in 1924. And if you want to learn more about that specific event, I covered it on my YouTube channel in an earlier video. It's right here. It's called Scariest Bigfoot Attacks, and I'll also include a link in the description. And while some people believe there are literally ape men running around this gorge on Mount St. Helens, there's never been a confirmed sighting. However, However, there was an event in 1950 that forced the general public to come to terms with the idea that there could be ape men running around Ape Canyon, or at least a large predator somewhere out there. In 1950, 32-year-old Jim Carter was a member of the National Ski Patrol at a ski area called the Milwaukee Bowl, which is in the state of Washington. Like everybody else on the ski patrol, Jim was a highly skilled skier and mountaineer. In May of that year, Jim was a part of a 20-person climbing party from Seattle, Washington. Their plan was to go to Mount St. Helens, hike up above the tree line, pick a spot, and then ski back down again. So the group arrives at Mount St. Helens, they hike up the mountain, they reach the spot where they want to ski down from, they sit down, they're putting their skis on, and Jim puts his on, and he says to the group, hey, why don't I ski down a little ways, I'll set up my camera on a tripod, and I'll take a picture of you guys as you pass, and then I'll follow you down to the bottom. And the group said, great, that sounds awesome. And Jim wanted to use his camera, so it was a win-win. So Jim, in full view of the entire group as they're getting ready, he skis down a little ways and then turns left into an area called Dog's Head, which was a little bit flatter than the area they were in, so probably a better spot to set up his tripod. But as soon as he turned left into that area, he was out of view of the main group. So after a few minutes, as the group is getting their stuff on, they took a little bit longer because they're trying to time it. So they all leave at the same time because they want to get this picture all at once. And so they take a little bit of extra time. They're all ready. And then finally, they head down and they make that left. They're going to pass by Dog's Head specifically so Jim can take their picture. But when they bank around the corner... Jim's not there. And so they're looking around and they're saying to each other, did he tell us he was going somewhere else? Because it seemed an awful lot like he was going to Dog's Head, but obviously he's not here. And so someone said, well, maybe he got annoyed with us because we were taking so long to get ready up there and he just already went to the bottom. And so they agreed, that's what he did. And so they got back together again and they headed down to the bottom. But when they got to the bottom, 
Jim wasn't there. And so they sat there for a few extra minutes looking up at the mountain and they're, they're kind of scanning down at the bottom and they're looking all over the place, but there's no sign of Jim. And so the group started to get really worried and they contacted authorities. When the first search team arrived, they went up to the area where the group thought Jim had been setting up at Dog's Head. And as they were looking around, all they could find was this discarded film box. So not any film or camera inside, just a box that would have held the film. It was kind of buried in the snow. Near this film box, they found Jim Carter's ski tracks and they were not angled south towards the bottom of the mountain where the whole ski group had gone. They were angled east towards Ape Canyon. And they followed Jim's tracks and they said they never deviated. They were total straight lines, like he was not trying to slow down. In fact, he was trying to go as fast as he possibly could. And at some point he began leaping over these huge ice crevasses that if you miss time, it's a death sentence. You're going into the crevasse. And he didn't just jump over one, he jumped over two, three, four at full speed without slowing down and then his tracks got all the way to the edge where it overlooked Ape Canyon and he went flying off. When the head of the search team saw this crazy ski line from Jim Carter, he said to the media that the only reason a guy like Jim, an expert skier who would never take risks like this, the only reason he would be skiing like this is if his life was in danger or if he was being pursued. So the search teams moved down into Ape Canyon and for five days, 75 people combed the entirety of Ape Canyon up and back over and over and over again. They never found Jim and they never found his skis or his camera or anything. And the whole time they were looking, those 75 searchers would report that anytime they were alone, they had the distinct feeling they were being watched. And it got so uncomfortable for many of them that they refused to go back into the gorge unless they had someone right next to them. After those five days of searching almost exclusively inside of Ape Canyon, they spent another five days not only continuing to search Ape Canyon, but also the surrounding areas. And finally, after 10 days of finding no trace of Jim Carter, the search was terminated. The only rational thing investigators could point to as the reason behind why this happened to Jim was he was diabetic and he had forgotten his insulin that day. So perhaps he became hypoglycemic and he became confused and then managed to ski off the cliff into Ape Canyon where he landed in such a way that he remained hidden. Or like the head of the search party seems to think, he was being pursued. He was skiing for his life. Whatever was chasing him had scared him so badly that he was skiing in a straight line down a cliff, jumping over ice crevasses before falling into Ape Canyon. And then presumably whatever forced him off the edge went down and scooped him up and took him away. And that's why they couldn't find him. But unless someone finds his body or finds some other piece of compelling evidence, we will probably never know for sure what happened to Jim Carter. Somewhere out in the Sierra Nevada mountain range lies a small hunting camp that's been there since the 1950s. Despite its fame, only a handful of people know exactly where this camp is. But even if you were given explicit directions on how to get there, you might just walk past it because it's tucked away in the middle of the woods up on this mountain. It's just a small fire pit, a couple of logs around it, another log set up for cutting wood, and you know, there's some paths that have been beaten down over the years from its occupants, but it's pretty much unremarkable. According to camp members, the fastest way to get to the site is by horseback, and it's approximately eight miles, and it's through very rugged terrain on this mountain, and it includes a 4,000 foot elevation gain. However, this eight mile trail is not marked and every year it changes slightly because trees will fall along the way changing the topography. Ron Moorhead, who's one of the four original camp members, laments the fact that anybody knows anything about this campsite. He wishes they could have kept it a secret but he knew that wasn't an option after what they discovered there in late 1971. In early 1971, Ron was a young man and he was invited out for the first time to the Sierra camp by the three founding members. When Ron got there, he fell in love. It was this beautiful, natural, pristine wilderness that overlooked this amazing valley and they're surrounded by these huge white fir trees. There's a freshwater stream that trickled by. And in terms of hunting, the deer were plentiful. Ron said this campsite was the closest to heaven he thinks he'll ever get. The only real drawback of the site was the large bear population, but they always had guns on them and they built this shelter out of heavy fallen timbers that they could go inside, shut the door, and they'd be protected from the bears until they left. When there wasn't a bear threat, they slept on the ground in tents. In late 1971, Ron came back to the camp with the other three founding members. They'd had a great day of hunting and they were standing around the campfire just chatting with each other when they started hearing a grunting sound not far away from them in the forest. Now, typically, whenever a bear came to their campsite, it was usually at night and they would hear it grunting somewhere off in the forest. 
And as soon as they heard it, they would stop and they would listen to kind of confirm it was a bear. And if it was, they would go inside of their shelter and they would wait for it to leave. But this time when they stopped to listen to confirm it was a bear, the sound they heard next was something they had never heard before. And it was so frightening, they almost fell over each other running to get inside of the shelter. It was like a whooping sound you would expect from an ape, except instead of a series of whoops like you would expect from an ape, it was one loud whoop and then silence, and then another creature somewhere else made a responding whoop that sounded different than the first. There was at least two creatures that were basically speaking to each other out in the forest out of view. Ron would say, as these creatures were howling and whooping at each other out in the forest, the men were huddled around inside of the shelter looking at each other like, what is that? Has anybody heard that sound before? And nobody knew what it was. And after a little while, they heard these creatures running towards the camp. They were pretty well off, but they heard these heavy footsteps approaching. And so Ron and the others, they put themselves up against these slats inside of the shelter where they could look out in the direction where these creatures were. And they're staring out just past the light of their campfire into the dark forest. And they hear these things running, 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 and they stop. They don't come into the clearing. It's like they're just outside of where they could see. And then their tone completely changes. These creatures, which are now one on one side of the camp and one on the other, begin speaking to each other in a language that almost sounds human, but it was nonsensical. It sounded like an imitation of a human language, but not human. And so Ron and the others are terrified and they're just staring through the slats, waiting to see this creature that's gonna emerge at some point, but it never does. Instead, the creatures continue to stay outside of the light and they move around behind their shelter out of view. And so Ron and the others move to the very middle of their shelter to get as far away from the walls as they can because there are breaks in the walls and they're worried one of these things is gonna reach through and grab them. But finally, after hours of these creatures running around the perimeter of their camp communicating in this totally otherworldly language, they started whooping again and ran off. And for the rest of the night, Ron and the other three stayed right in that shelter. The next day when the sun came up, the men were out of that camp as fast as they could. These are hard, rugged men, and they were very shaken up by this experience. And they tried to talk about it, but there was just no way to describe what they were hearing and experiencing. And so they just decided they just wanted to get out of there as fast as possible, and they'll deal with this later. But as soon as they got out of the woods and back to their homes, they didn't talk about it anymore, except Ron became obsessed with whatever it was that was making that sound. He so desperately wanted to find out what it was. And so he convinced the other three members to come with him and go back to the campsite, except this time Ron was gonna bring an audio recorder and he was gonna try to capture some audio of these creatures. And so the four men went back to the campsite. They didn't even hunt that day. They stayed right near the campsite. They made this big fire and they're all just kind of nervously sitting there waiting, kind of hoping it happens and also hoping it doesn't happen. And at some point in the evening, Ron said he heard footsteps way out in the middle of the forest and they sounded like they were running towards the camp. The four men sprint inside the shelter, lock it behind them, and Ron turns on the audio recorder. Now, before you listen to this famous recording, here are its bona fides. After being recorded, Ron sent it to Dr. R. Lynn Curlin, who is a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Wyoming, and he and his team analyzed it, and they concluded that one, it was unaltered, so it's not been edited, it's not been doctored in any way, it's an authentic audio recording. And two, whatever was making the sounds could not have been a man because their vocal range was dramatically higher and lower than that of a human's. The doctor said based on average average pitch and tract length, the creature that was making the sound most likely was between seven foot three and eight feet tall. In addition to the Dr. Curlin examination, a cryptolinguist expert named Scott Nelson also pointed out that it would have been nearly impossible in 1971 for Ron or any of the other hunters to dub the sound of their voices, which are on the recording, over the sounds that these creatures were making. Because a couple times in the recording, you hear both sets of voices happening at once. That's something you couldn't have done in 1971. Despite numerous attempts to debunk this recording, it still stands as a legitimate, unedited recording. Although what they were recording is still a mystery. Have a listen.
across the creek at the big rocks. It's a hard act to follow. You sound like he talks to others and they talk to each other. Yeah. Right there, I just see movement right through there. Shortly after this recording was made, Ron stopped hunting at this camp. However, over the years, he has gone back several times because he's obsessed with trying to find out what's out in the forest. But he says to this day, he still has no idea. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please go over to the Like Button's house on the next really hot day and ask them to get you a cold drink. While they're gone, put a large raw salmon in their AC vent. In 21 21-year-old Deanna Wilde had just separated from her husband and she was living with her two friends, Virginia and BJ McGinnis, who were both 54 years old. On April 2nd of that year, the trio decided to visit Big Sur, which is the very beautiful but very steep and dangerous section of the Central California coastline. They pulled over at a particular cliff overlooking the water to take some pictures. Afterwards, as they were getting ready to go back to their car, Deanna wanted a closer look, so she stepped to the edge of the cliff where she lost her footing and she fell 500 feet to her death. It was ruled an accident, so investigating officers refrained from taking any on-scene photographs, accepting instead Virginia's photographs that she said she had taken right before it happened. Deanna's mother was unable to afford a funeral for her daughter, and so the only person she could think to ask to help her was a lawyer that went to the same church as her. His name was Steve Keeney, and and Steve said, yeah, of course, I'll try to make some phone calls for you and see what I can do. And in doing so, he wound up learning about the case, about what happened to Deanna. And he discovered that her two friends, Virginia and BJ, had actually taken a life insurance policy out on Deanna the day before she fell off the cliff. And so Steve began digging into the backgrounds of Virginia and BJ, and he discovered that Virginia had a history of being around a high number of accidental deaths and suspicious fires, and that she had cashed in a whole bunch of life insurance policies. So all of a sudden, Deanna's death did not look accidental. Steve would become obsessed with the idea that the McGinnises were behind Deanna's death, but unfortunately, there was virtually no evidence to support that because when she died, the investigating officers ruled it an accident. So there was no crime scene, there was no evidence collected, the autopsy was very cursory, and so Steve would spend five years building a case against Virginia and BJ, but at the end of those five years, it was a rock solid case and Virginia and BJ were arrested. During their trial, the real story of what happened to Deanna finally emerged. On that April day in 1987, the trio went to Big Sur and they had lunch together, they had a picnic, and while they were eating, BJ slipped some of his prescription antidepressants into Deanna's drink. And so after lunch, the drugs were in Deanna's system and she began to get very drowsy to the point where Virginia and BJ had to literally hold her up. She was falling over, she was so tired. And so while Deanna's in the state, Virginia and BJ tell her, hey, let's go over to the cliffs and take some pictures. And so they walk over, Deanna's stumbling and BJ's holding her up and they get to the edge of the cliff and BJ turns around so the ocean's at his back and he's propping up Deanna and Virginia steps away and she takes their picture. And then right after that picture, BJ, while still holding Deanna, turned around to face the water and kind of carried Deanna right to the edge and Virginia took one more picture of them facing the water. And then right after that picture was taken, BJ took Deanna and threw her off the cliff. But perhaps the most disturbing part of this case is that as soon as he threw her off, Deanna kind of came to and whipped herself around and managed to grab onto the cliff with her hands. And so she's literally dangling, holding onto this ledge like in the movies, begging to be pulled back up. And Virginia and BJ, instead of helping her back up, picked up rocks and bashed her hands until she fell off the cliff. Ultimately, it would be these last two pictures that Virginia took that got her and BJ convicted of killing Deanna because these pictures clearly showed Deanna was impaired compared to the earlier pictures on the camera roll. And the only reason these pictures existed is because Virginia wanted a trophy from the killing because she was actually an uncaught serial killer that went around killing people and cashing in their life insurance policies. One of her victims even included her own three-year-old daughter. BJ would actually die during his trial. As for Virginia, she was found guilty and sent to jail for life. Here are the final two pictures that Virginia took of Deanna.
On July 30th, 2016, Janice Stewart was at home in College Station, Texas, preparing for a wedding she was going to be photographing the following week. Her 34-year-old daughter named Sunday Rowan lived a few hours away in San Antonio, and she was planning to go with her to help her take these pictures. As Janice worked, her cell phone kept buzzing. Since sunrise, Sunday had been Snapchatting her photos of her and her husband, Matt, who was also 34, as they got ready for their hot air balloon ride that day. 18 months earlier, Sunday had bought Matt the tickets as a birthday gift, but the trip kept getting delayed because of bad weather. But on this July morning, the weather had cleared up and the trip was finally happening. Sunday and Matt often sought adventure to balance the demands of their jobs. Matt was the chief of clinical trials at the Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio and was a rising star in the field of burn research. Sunday worked at Crazy 8, which was a kid's clothing store, and she was devoted to her young son from a previous relationship. At 6.58 that morning, Janice received an image of the balloon's ground crew prepping the wicker basket that would hold her daughter, her son-in-law, and the rest of the other passengers. Around 7.30, Janice received another image. This one was a selfie of Sunday and Matt posing inside of the wicker basket. They were up in the air. There's a beautiful field below them. They're smiling and they're hugging. After that, the messages stopped. 10 minutes later at 7.40, 85-year-old Buddy Miller was making breakfast in his ranch when he heard two loud explosions. The first one actually rattled his house. When he looked out the window, he saw this massive plume of black smoke on another rancher's land off in the distance. Alarmed, he jumped in his pickup truck and raced past his cows to the blaze a half mile away. Commotion like this rarely occurred in Maxwell, Texas, a quiet rural community about 40 miles south of Austin. At her home just up the road was 66-year-old Margaret Wiley, who heard the explosions too. She said the first one reminded her of the sound her 20-gauge shotgun made. When she stepped onto the porch, she heard the second explosion, and she said it sounded like a loud pop, followed by a whooshing sound, like the sound a gas stove makes when it ignites. When she looked out towards where the sounds had come from, she saw this massive fireball explode in the distance, and she immediately called 911. When Buddy and the other first responders arrived at the scene, they saw this huge fire at the base of a power line tower, and at first they couldn't figure out what was actually burning. They heard the sound of hissing propane tanks and thought maybe it was a tractor or a baler that had caught on fire, but upon closer inspection, they saw a wicker basket and they saw bodies. This was a hot air balloon accident. It would turn out the pilot of that hot air balloon was 49-year-old Skip Nichols, and he had elected to fly that day despite a low cloud cover that had grounded the other hot air balloon companies in the area that morning. Also, Skip was on a mixture of prescription and over-the-counter drugs that impaired his ability to fly the balloon safely. After being in the air for eight miles above the clouds, Skip decided it was time to land, and so he blindly descended through the clouds and he immediately hit a power line. An arc carrying 340,000 volts of electricity cut the balloon's metal support cables like a torch. As soon as the basket began plummeting toward the earth, the fuel lines disconnected from the burners overhead, spraying liquid propane up into the burners and then arced back down into the wicker basket, immediately engulfing the entire thing in flames. The burning basket fell over 100 feet to the ground. By 10 a.m. that morning, Janice had still not heard from her daughter after that last text she sent, which included the picture of her and Matt, that selfie image, up in the balloon, and Janice was concerned that something had gone wrong. So she turned on the TV and the first thing she sees is hot air balloon crash in Texas, no survivors. And on the screen, she immediately recognized the smiley face that was on the balloon that had crashed because she recognized it from the images her daughter had sent her. Even before she got the official call, she knew instinctively that her daughter and her son-in-law were both gone. Here are the final pictures taken of Sunday, Matt, and the other 14 people who were on board that balloon.
On September 25th, 1978, a Pacific Southwest Airlines Boeing 727 jet airliner entered San Diego airspace. Like all PSA aircraft, Flight 182 had a whimsical black button nose and smiley face painted underneath the cockpit. These so-called grinning birds were synonymous with the company's self-promoting ad campaign about them being the world's friendliest airline. But the airline was often criticized for being too friendly with their super low airfares, their kind of comic banter that the captains would employ through the intercom to passengers, and their female flight attendants who wore miniskirts and were instructed to make nice with the male passengers. Because the weather was clear, air traffic control directed Captain McFerrin and First Officer Fox to switch from instrument flight rules to visual flight rules procedures and to begin their final descent. Visual flight rules refers to pilots using their eyes to guide the plane. It's done when they're flying low, the weather's clear, and they can see the ground. At 8.59 a.m. that morning, as PSA Flight 182 descended down to 4,000 feet, air traffic control advised them of a Cessna, which is a small plane that was ascending in their direction. Fox responded that they saw the Cessna, and so air traffic control came back and said to maintain visual separation. Maintain visual separation meant that despite ground radar-based controllers who could provide vertical and lateral separation criteria, the burden for maintaining separation fell solely on Captain McFerrin and his crew. In layman's terms, air traffic control was telling them, don't lose sight of the Cessna. Inside the Cessna was a flight instructor named Martin Casey and his student, who was a United States Marine named David Boswell. As this little plane ascended, air traffic control informed them that PSA 182, who was right in front of them and slightly above them, they were on their descent. However, they had the Cessna in sight. As a result, the men inside of the Cessna did not take it upon themselves to actively begin looking for this jet. They assumed the pilots of PSA 182, who had them in sight, would avoid them. Back in PSA 182, there seemed to be some confusion in the cockpit. The two pilots were debating whether the Cessna they were watching fly lower than them, past them on the right, was the same Cessna that air traffic control had told them about. And at some point they agreed, yep, that's got to be the same Cessna. And so they called in to air traffic control that it looks like the Cessna has passed us. They've flown past us on the right. Immediately after this transmission, the black box recorded the two pilots talking to each other, basically trying to convince the other that yes, that was definitely the right Cessna. But after a couple of minutes of reassuring themselves, one of them says, Boy, I hope that was the right Cessna. According to later testimony by the air traffic controller who was in communication with the pilots of PSA 182 as they were on their final descent, he would say when Captain McFerrin came over and said the Cessna has passed him on the right, he believed him and he didn't think to check to make sure it was the right one. But in reality, the Cessna that McFerrin and Fox had seen was the wrong one. The real Cessna they were supposed to maintain visual separation with, the one containing Casey and Boswell, was still ascending in the direct flight path of PSA 182, except now this Cessna is in 182's blind spot below their nose, so they literally can't see each other. At 9.01 that morning, air traffic control got an alarm that PSA 182 and this Cessna are about to collide, but for some reason, the air traffic controller did not alert both aircraft. Instead, this controller only contacted the Cessna and didn't tell them this was a dire situation. They said, hey, there's traffic in your vicinity, but I'm pretty sure it's just PSA 182 and they already see you, so you're fine. So Casey and Boswell inside of the Cessna just continued to ascend. One minute later at 9.02 a.m., PSA 182 flies directly over the Cessna and strikes them with their nose wheel. The Cessna gets hooked by the wheel and flips upside down and gets trapped underneath the right wing of the jet. Seconds later, the Cessna splits in two. The tail section containing David Boswell plummets to the earth like a rag doll. The nose section of the Cessna that contained Martin Casey stayed trapped underneath the right wing for a few seconds before it detonated. Inside of PSA 182, this explosion was deafening, and immediately after it, McFerrin was recorded saying, easy baby, easy baby. Then he asks Fox, what's the damage? And Fox says, it's bad, man, we're hit. Despite trying to keep the plane flying level, it lurched forward into an unrecoverable nosedive, and McFerrin, knowing they were doomed, calmly calls out to air traffic control and says, we're going down. Air traffic responded, okay, we'll have the equipment ready for you. Then the black box recorded the sound of a stall warning inside the cockpit. And as the aircraft streaked at over 300 miles per hour straight towards the ground, McFerrin's last known transmission to air traffic was, this is it, baby.
Seconds before impact, McFerrin gave his final command over the intercom, which was brace yourselves. And then right before the black box cut out, someone in the cabin yelled, I love you, mom. At 9.03 a.m., PSA 182 slammed nose first into the ground just outside of downtown San Diego in an area called North Park. The resulting explosion of thousands of gallons of jet fuel sent a shockwave that was registered two miles away. Almost immediately, firefighters were rushing towards the rising mushroom cloud of black oily smoke and many of the first responders that arrived at the crash site in those first few hours were deeply disturbed at what they saw. The bodies that had not been destroyed in the explosion had gotten trapped up in the trees. All told, 144 people were killed in this accident, 135 were from PSA 182, two were from the Cessna, and seven were just unlucky people that were standing on the ground in North Park. Following a one-year investigation into the mid-air collision, it was determined that the flight crew of PSA-182 was found to be primarily responsible because there was that moment that was picked up in the black box where the two pilots were unsure if the Cessna that passed them was the right one. But instead of calling that into air traffic control and getting confirmation, they blew it off. The morning of the crash, a San Diego photographer was at a press event when he heard the explosion overhead, which was 182 colliding with the Cessna, and he began taking pictures, and he captured these now two infamous photos of PSA 182 seconds before they hit the ground. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please offer to install brand new beautiful hardwood floors at the Like Button's house and on installation day, remove all of their original flooring and then quit the job.